Hello and welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we will be discussing spoilers as usual, so here's your warning. I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. And I'll start by asking, what is new to you, Alex? Um, I basically finished my book today. Yeah, that's so great! It, it this this the second um, round of edits was a little less exciting than um, the first round because it was m- much more like nitpicky kind of things. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like big broad strokes of creativity. It was more of like oh let's clean these couple things up. Um, yeah, just sort of refining it. Yeah, so there were I just had half of a poem to do today, and I did it and. I don't know. It feels really weird. It's like, I don't want it to be done Mm -hmm. because I liked working on it. And it's like, I'm nervous about it being done, you know? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I think that's the, that's the struggle that artists go through when it's time to be done with your art. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I I thought it wouldn't ever be done. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It's exciting, but it's also nerve-wracking, so. Yeah, that's that's so cool, though. It's getting so close. Yep, um, and I've got a couple readings lined up, too, so. Uh, yeah, that's super cool, too. Boy, I hope, very I exciting. I hope we'll be able to make it to the local one, because that's, I think, the closest I'm going to be to you for a while. Yeah, I really want to try to to make it to that. I I mean, with work, it's just harder to get up north, but I really, really, really want to be there. Yeah, I, and I tried to, it's like everybody has completely different schedules, so I tried to pick a <laughs> night that more people could get, but then, of course, there's certain people that are left out by that, so it's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, what can you do? It's your thing. It's your thing, and it should be that's, whatever works for you. Yeah. But I will be having two in Seattle that I have scheduled. I have. Oh, wow. Um, and those are in October and November. And then I have one sort of scheduled for Bellingham in January. Oh, boy. That's a month to be in Bellingham. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. But it, it was the first thing, the first availability they had open, so... Well, you'll have to tell me uh, when you when you get up there how the town has changed since we left. I'm like, I haven't been up there probably two and a half years, so it's going to be uh, weird. See, I haven't been up since I graduated. I think I went like six months after, and then that was the only time. Yeah. Yeah, it would be weird to go back. Like, I, I still know some people who go to school up there, so mm-hmm. I like hear about it, you know, on Facebook, but I don't... Uh, I just haven't had the occasion to get up there. Yeah, I have a lot of um, classmates that still live there, too. So, mm-hmm. But I definitely want to get up there and share all the stuff with them. And well, like, yeah, I mean, that would that'd be so cool for, you know, people in the creative writing program at Western to, like, hear that there's a, you know, an alum that's in town reading some of his work that's published. Like, that's right? that's a really cool thing. I would love to read on campus, but I don't know, like, I'd how have to, to make get in that touch. happen. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably have to get in touch with the alumni association, and like, yeah, might be worth it. It might be, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna anyway, be up there I, anyway, that's definitely not what we need to talk about on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. That might be a bit of a digression. Well, and like, like anybody cares about like an alumni association? <laughs> yeah. Very riveting discussion. Right. What <laughs> have you been how... doing? <laughs> um, you know, not a lot, but I got something really cool happened just today. Uh, so, do you know the website um, ACX, I believe is what it's called? No. It's It's um, affiliated with Audible and Amazon, and basically mm-hmm. it's a service for... Amazon published authors, like independent authors, to yeah, yeah. find narrators to collaborate on audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And just this morning, I received an offer to narrate somebody's book. 
That's so, so cool. Yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be recording an audio book, like a real one that's gonna be <laughs> on Audible.com, and I will get royalties from it. Whoa. I mean, I don't know if anyone's gonna buy the book, but you know, yeah. you gotta start somewhere. <laughs> that's so. Did you just like go in and like sign up to like let people? Or what, yeah. how, what was the process for that? So it, it's it's really, really easy to do. Like, you just go and you make a profile. Um, and mm-hmm. it, if you have any um, previous work, you can upload samples yeah. just mm-hmm. for people to find you. If you don't, it's a good idea to just, like, record some excerpts Snip, from things yeah, just yeah. to mm-hmm. give people an idea of what you can do. And then you can yeah. just go on there. If you're a narrator, you go and you just browse through, like, books that are accepting auditions Mm -hmm. and then they just will have like an excerpt from their book up there and you just record it and submit it to them and then they just listen to all of the auditions and pick who they like that is really cool Uh uh-huh and then if you're an author on there you can like browse through people who are on there as narrators and like Mm -hmm. see if you can find somebody that you like based on their previous work and you can make them an offer Mm mm-hmm but I just found this and auditioned for it like last night, and then this morning I had the I had the the offer. I was like, "Whoa, that was fast!" <laughs> yeah, they must have loved it. Yeah, well, and this is his first time, so I think he was just like, "Oh boy, somebody who can do this has auditioned. Yeah, I better yeah. jump on it." <laughs> you know. Um, what What's the genre? Uh, it seems to be like a contemporary fantasy, but Ooh. it's hard to tell. You know, it was just a short excerpt a snippet, that I yeah. read. But yeah, I think it's a, a contemporary. Book. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't know like how much is like you know. Am I not supposed? To, I don't know. It's a published yeah. book, so whatever. Like you yeah. can find it. But uh, <laughs> but no, I'm super duper stoked. So I'll be um, working on that for the next couple of months. The finished product is due in January. So are you just going to be using your own uh, recording software and then sending the file? Yeah, it's just up to me to produce the whole thing. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I, the way that so it works like you um, you get the manuscript and then uh, record the first fifteen minutes and submit mm-hmm. that for the author to sort of like check out and see like what you're doing and like give you any notes like oh I want this character to sound like that or this name is pronounced that way or whatever. Yeah. And then once you get the notes based on the first fifteen minutes, you just record it chapter by chapter until you're done. Nice. Yeah, I know. I'm really stoked. It's just gonna be very fun. Like You're I don't know. You're gonna be in the gonna... closet a lot more. <laughs> just sitting in this closet <laughs> all day, every day. Oh boy. Uh, well, maybe it'll encourage me to actually make a really proper recording setup, depending on how this goes. Because that yeah, would be I cool. Mean... Like it's just like a cool hobby to like maybe make some extra money. Well, yeah, and it's it's probably like sort of like with YouTube, if you start off with like you know, half of pennies or whatnot. And then, yeah. it, it, the, you know, if you have, let's say, like, five that you're getting royalties from, you know, that starts to add up. Yeah, and actually the way that this royalties works, it's pretty generous. It's a 50-50 split. Ooh. Yeah, on, That's yeah, really whatever good. whatever the audiobook makes, I just get half of it. Wow. Yeah, That's I know. Incredible. So, like, if it sells any, then I will get some money. That's, like, a decent you know i mean it's like it's not going to be expensive like audiobooks are cheap but at least it's like yeah but still that's really in cool. dollar amounts so. right <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah yeah it was just so to easy to. i will yeah i'll let you know how it goes this is going to be a fun thing to do uh and it was just super duper duper easy like it just phew, happened yeah so. you, should, you should put a link to the to the site um uh, first yeah. so people can check it out. He's, yeah, anybody's curious about it. Because, yeah, I heard about it from a friend, and I'd been sort of considering checking it out for a while, and then last night I was just like, screw it, let's just try it out, and here I am, the next morning. Right. <laughs> and here I offer. am, employed. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a contract and everything. They needed my right, tax information. Awesome. Oh. So. <laughs> well, that, mean, that means it's legit, though. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's through Amazon. Like, it's a totally, yeah. like, above board and mm-hmm. legit situation. Like, and with the royalty split payment, like, they handle everything. If yeah. I was being paid an hourly rate, because you can also be paid um, a rate per finished hour of work, mm-hmm. um, it would be up to the author to To keep pay track me. of the hours, yeah. Yeah, well, and just to pay me. Like, they yeah. have to do it. But with the royalty split, 
they just it just automatically happens. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, do you want to get on to the topic of the day? I do. Okay, so we're talking about the Adventure Zone. Uh, If anyone out there who may be listening to this doesn't know what the Adventure Zone is, shame on you. Uh, (laughs) It's a fantastic podcast recorded by the McElroy family. That's Griffin... Travis, Justin, and their dad, Clint McElroy, uh, and they just play Dungeons and Dragons, and it's the best story maybe that's ever been told. <laughs> well, and and I would I would sort of to people like, oh, they just play Dungeons and Dragons, and you listen to it. It's not that they created no. their own story. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I, I'd say for mo- you know most at least dms who you know really know what they're doing that's how it tends to go when you yeah, play true. But... but like I, I, the 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 person listening that might not know how that goes yeah you know it's not just like some generic thing they're doing like they, they... <laughs> no it's not <laughs> griffin wrote a story and the rest of them mess with it <laughs> yeah well yeah and see that's the interesting thing. i think that's a, that's a great place to start because you know a lot of people sort of question whether or not like the 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 word railroading has been thrown around a lot um as far as people feeling like maybe just or griffin didn't give the boys enough sort of room to do what they wanted to do like people thought maybe he was you know controlling things a little too much and um they have spoken a lot about like no that is super not the case like we all feel like this is extremely collaborative and if there was anything happening that our characters wouldn't do we wouldn't do it so well yeah and 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 so people know i i sort of started so there's 69 episodes i was probably nice right (laughs) (laughs) around i want to say 50 um (gasps) yeah i wasn't around for very long i know but i like back I, 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 I will, but, like, it because of their personalities, I think, mm-hmm. and the way that the story is told, you can jump in pretty much anywhere, and, like, I didn't feel... Uh, but, but then again, maybe I was uh, jumping at the right moment, because it was just before the Stolen Century. Yeah, if there's sort anywhere... Of like, late game to really rewrite the history of it all (laughs) yeah it's like let's go back and tell it from further back before the beginning even okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah and by the way like our uh our spoiler warning at the beginning of the episode is in full effect right now we're talking about (laughs) the end of this podcast so like maybe if you might listen to it just turn this off. Like, I want you to listen to our podcast, but, like... <laughs> or, or what I... I know a lot of people, and myself included, would be like, I'm not really sure if I'm really into this. We we probably won't, like, be giving you, like, the cool, fun details. We're definitely going to be talking about, like, the overarching things and maybe some fun, exciting things that happen. But we're not... Like, you're still going to get a lot out of it if you just... Sure. If you absolutely. know what happens, It's, I you mean... Know. Hearing people talk about it is not the same. That being said, there are some major, major spoiler moments that I'm still keeping secret from Dylan because he has only listened to the first arc. So, like, uh-huh. I wanted, I want to dress up as Loop for Halloween, but I can't because that would spoil the story for him. <laughs> <laughs> like, that would be very... so much fun to dress up as one of them because, and and this is another thing we can talk about is they are so focused on having it like whatever you imagine these characters look like that's what they look like yes i love how vague they are about describing them to the point where they could have any body type be any ethnicity like there's so so little description like a couple of times a bit of physical description has slipped out where they you know maybe will describe taco as slimmer but At the same time, they're like, feel free to throw anything that we say about their appearance out. Whatever taco looks like to you, that's taco. Like, don't Mm -hmm. even worry about it, which is super important. Yeah, it's it's important, and it and it it is complicated, but it's but they they're they're willing to try, you know. It is, and 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 it's just so great that you know this is 
one format that really does lend itself to that because, you know, like, you know, first of all, it's non-visual, but, mm-hmm. you know, in, in a book, you feel like, you know, you got to, it could be very frustrating if the author doesn't describe the characters in the narration, but in this case, there isn't any. Like, it's all just, like, action and dialogue, you know, much like a play or something, and so physical descriptions rarely even have an opportunity to come up, so that means you can just fill in that blank however you want to. Well, and it also sort of gets past that whole messy business of, like, an author will write a book and you, as a reader, will imagine a character somehow, and then, say, the movie comes out, you're like, this <laughs> blank, you know? Or like, yeah. Oh, um, man, uh, have you read Name of the Wind by Patrick no. Rothfuss? Mm-mm. Oh, okay, um, get on it. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, one of the best fantasy books I've ever read. But he's just recently, um, there's this Kickstarter going on with a deck of illustrated playing cards mm-hmm. um, for Name of the Wind, and so it's got, like, full painted illustrations of the characters and on one hand I think it's very very cool but on the other hand I don't like seeing this like <laughs> version of these characters because it's like I didn't think she looked like that I don't yeah. know she did, that's not right to me and it's very very cool but it is also a little irritating to me to see that happen well and the example that I think of is um the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child play <sighs> I, a lot of people are so all for having a black Hermione, but I also know a lot of people that read the book that are, like, just, like, confused by that. Yeah, I mean, that was a huge thing. Personally, I, I subscribe to the sure why not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Me too. Like, she could absolutely have been black. There's no reason she couldn't have. But, yeah, that was a whole thing and and there has been with um with the adventure zone a lot of this sort of push and pull in the community the fan community about what it's acceptable for the characters to look like which is mm-hmm. really fascinating there's a lot of politics there like it's yeah. interesting how there are certain characters who just like sort of have reached mostly a consensus as far as their their looks like taco is all over the map everybody has their own version of taco like he's just (laughs) anything and everything because he's sort of the most (laughs) fun and crazy one to play with he's got a a really big personality yeah he's got that big personality and there's just so much you can do with that is he like a garbage can man is he fashion (laughs) boy what is he i don't know uh (laughs) but a character like kravitz Pretty much every time I see him, he looks the same. Like, Mm -hmm. everybody draws him as this very handsome black man wearing a suit and, like, like maybe a red cravat, often with dreadlocks. Or Mm -hmm. sometimes, honestly, I see him looking often a lot like David Diggs, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm not sure how David Diggs became everybody's headcanon for Kravitz, but it works for me. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, Merle, he's pretty much always just like, okay, take Dwarf. Now he's got some flowers and a Hawaiian shirt. That's Merle. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. <laughs> but one that was really fascinating to me was seeing the fan um, sort of, the fan culture surrounding Loop, especially previous to her official reveal. Mm-hmm. Like, people were pretty sure that that was what was going to happen. And I was honestly pretty impressed with people for so- sorting for that one out. Because yeah. I, mm-hmm. I didn't until, like, people were talking about it. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That would be cool. And then it was true. So, like, I was seeing Loop fan art before Loop was even introduced. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> like, before Taco got his memory back. It was crazy. Well, yeah, and, and being... Or having started at that sort of almost, you know, the last leg of the run race or whatever, like, I basically learned of all those new characters right when everybody else did it. And I, I, did, I didn't know if I was, if I had, if they had met them before or, you know. Oh, yeah, you didn't know the gravity of the situation. Yeah, whereas, like, the, the, the brothers and Clint were like, who are these people and why do we know them so well? Like, <laughs> like what's going on? What is any of this? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. like, it's really crazy. Um, and then for them to have to just jump in and roll with it was was pretty impressive, especially on uh, Justin's part with Taco and Loop just rolling with the whole, now I have a twin sister thing. Yeah. Uh, and it, it went so well, too. Like, 
bravo to Justin and Griffin for handling that the way they did because it just worked like it was great you know people were kind of worried like oh no is this like gonna be a problem for Justin like is he gonna feel like Griffin has taken over his character like this is a big big thing to change about Taco but immediately he was like am I going to role play loop? (laughs) And Griffin's like, no, I think I will do that. You better just stick to taco. (laughs) And he's like, just everything. It's just like a hundred percent taco and loop. And it like, he was just in it. And like, he came up with the, the bit that just really melted my heart. And was like, I was like, this is the most beautiful thing that's ever happened is when taco first called her Lulu. I was like, (laughs) Like, it's so real and good, and I just couldn't take it. It's so good. And and the, the, I would say the Stolen Century arc is also, like, the, the place where it shows that Griffin wasn't in control, like, at all. <laughs> I know, for real. Like, he, he a lot of times he would be like, you're going to have a conversation, pick who you want to have a conversation with. Yeah, and, and that was, like, he, that was his whole sort of concept behind that arc was, like, okay, it's up to you what happened in this time, and that is going to influence what you're going to be capable of when we get back to the present. Yeah, it was this really interesting, like, reverse character and world building. Oh, it was fascinating. Like It was, if- it was beautiful, too. Like, the worlds they discovered, the magical artifacts they created. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, ah, oh, the origin of the Umbra staff. Like... Man, that doesn't mean as much to you as it did to me, but it was really, really rad. It was it was pretty cool, and 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 I had I you know knew a little bit about the um, the seven or not yeah the whatever they were called. Um, oh, the grand relics. The grand relics, because they were they were just you know finishing getting them. Uh huh. Um, when I jumped in, and then then they were like going back and creating them, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's really yeah. cool. I mean, and like, you know, for, for how, you know, just like imagine, you know, this and this three year long story of that, like yeah. getting mm-hmm. invested in it and like getting suspicious of it and, you know, wondering what Lucretia's really up to. Like, oh, it was, it was super, like, it's crazy. I couldn't tell you the number of times that that podcast has made me weep. Like, like it's, oh my God. Like I cried I was listening to one of the later episodes at work one day. Bad Mm -hmm. decision. I was, like, (laughs) sitting at my desk at work trying not to cry. I was like, "Mm, hold it together. Don't let it show. You're at work. Well, yeah, and I would say, like, I would, if anyone, if I were to recommend it to anyone, I would definitely stay start from the beginning because I didn't have that emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I felt their emotions because they're so attached, but... Uh, I, I wasn't as attached, and I can. Oh man! I can actually re- remember the the scene that I entered the story on. Mm-hmm. It was something. It was Barry, like <laughs> it was his his like journal. Oh. And he had just died, I guess. Oh, it was his little stone. His like. Yes. Like mm-hmm. here's what's up. Like I'm recording this so that yeah, mm-hmm. y'all know, and so and that I was, know. Like, such a weird obviously like obviously a weird place to jump in but it hooked me immediately because i was like i've never heard anything like this yeah it's really and okay i will say to people who um will start from the beginning like just hold tight because <laughs> the beginning is really different <laughs> they didn't know what well, yeah, they were the doing beginning is, is yeah they were they in fact it started out as an episode of their other podcast my brother my brother and me because, uh, oh, really? yeah, Justin was going to be on paternity leave um, mm-hmm. when Charlie was born. And uh, so they were like, okay, let's, like, record something ahead of time that we can put in to fill up a week. Um, I know, yeah. let's play Dungeons & Dragons. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> 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 so we can thank the birth of little Chuck for the... <laughs> <laughs> for the existence of the Adventure Zone. Thanks, baby Charlie. But, uh, uh, so it, it occurred to me, like, there's a lot of stuff in the finale and in, like, the, the second to last episode that probably, like, left you a little confused and you didn't 
really know what they were referencing because like there there's so many callbacks and they're bringing back so many characters oh yeah there there were like so many characters basically the only ones i was immediately familiar with were in the bureau of balance Mm -hmm. um and then like just people they had mentioned um so yeah they they like i didn't know who the goddess was oh I didn't yeah know, you, like, didn't, you don't know village Istis, people of all the different places you didn't know sloan and hurley you didn't oh no. that's one bit like it it's crazy to me to think that we had such different experiences of that moment um when mavis is running away in gold cliff and then she's rescued by the dryads like i bet for you you were like mm-hmm. who are these dryads uh and for me i was like <gasps> They're dryads now. <laughs> like it was, I cried a lot at that moment. Like it was so meaningful to me that that happened. And f- I'm sure you were just like, huh, who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> but then there were moments that we shared where um, Taco goes into that other dimension, our dimension. Yeah. Um, I assume. Oh my God, and, Joaquin like, is my favorite. On the taco truck. Joaquin is my favorite <laughs> ever. I love him so much. Whereas, as far as I'm aware, that was just off, out of the blue, new. Yeah, well, I mean, and this whole quest for tacos was, like, a joke from the beginning. So, like, the way that they paid that one off was, frankly, astounding. Like, I had fully (laughs) expected Griffin to just drop it all together, and then we got to that bit in The Stolen Century where there was, like, he ate something, and there was, like, a connection, like, across worlds. Like, there was a bond with somebody somewhere, and I'm like what are you talking about, Griffin? (laughs) And the way that paid off was so... Because people were like, "Eh, I don't know if I like the idea of, like, attributing tacos to this, like, elf. Like, this is part of Mexican culture, and maybe this isn't a cool thing to do. So, like, maybe tacos shouldn't invent tacos. And so then for Taco to learn how to make tacos from a Mm Mexican-American boy is, like... What a great payoff. And it's right. like this amazing moment. <laughs> and then like, and then they just get so much power, so powerful together. Yes, they go freaking Super Saiyan. It's the coolest thing ever. Oh, man. In that scene, didn't he actually like basically describe it as Super yeah, Saiyan? Yeah, so he may have used those words. Like, I know at some point he does, but. <laughs> in the finale, he did use those words, but I don't know if it was in that scene. Yeah, it's. <laughs> It's so good. It's so good. And the Overwatch references were just adorable. Uh, Yeah, that was a really well-handled thing. Like, my hat is off to Griffin, I mean, a thousand times by now. But, like, that was a really fantastic payoff for that stupid joke. (laughs) Well, yeah, to be able to turn something so silly and, you know, just silly into something... That's both silly and meaningful. Yes. Is really, really hard to do. When, like, when they were using the Bond engine to, like, summon people in that fight, oh that was goodness. such a that, great final That was so cool. The, like, final fantasy fight end. that was going on. I loved it so yeah. much. But when he summoned Joaquin, I exploded. Like, he runs up and he <laughs> hugs him, and I was like, ah, my boy, Joaquin, <laughs> my boy. I loved it so much. Uh, that was. Man, they really picked all the right people to summon in that fight too. Like mm-hmm. it was I was trying to think like who should they have summoned? And I could not come up with anyone else that would have been better. Like I couldn't yeah. think of like when when Merle summoned Garfield the Deals Warlock. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't, I didn't know who that was, but I was oh, very funny. Oh, God. Like, that's so tragic to me that you... Because, <laughs> so, in their... The episodes that are called um, Lunar Interludes, basically, they're between yeah. arcs. Mm-hmm. When they go back to the base, they have an opportunity to go to the fantasy Costco and spend mm-hmm. their money on items. And Garfield the Deals Warlock runs the fantasy Costco. Okay, then I had met him um, right as they were going at, towards... At the end, uh, when, when he... Because yeah, he had, like, they, Magnus's, yeah. like, DNA. <laughs> <laughs> it's never explained yes. why Garfield, like, was doing that. <laughs> and, I, and I love it that that's just like, <laughs> what were you doing, Garfield? Why were you, like, growing a Magnus? What was that for? <laughs> it's so bizarre and sinister. But um, are you aware uh, Garfield the Deals Warlock was actually a uh, My Brother, My Brother and Me reference? 
Um, I haven't been listening to my brother and my brother and me for long enough. I don't. Oh think. well, the, yeah. I mean, I haven't necessarily either, but I've just listened to a lot of the backlog. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, there was this free and I can't even remember like what the situation was like Travis and Justin were talking about some kind of like making some kind of a deal. And somebody said, like, do you need a deals warlock? And I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, these brothers, like that, that's just a thing that one of them would say. And then Griffin was just like, I'm Garfield, the deals warlock. And like, he just went on this thing with this character and it just became this bit on Mabim Bam. And so when Garfield shows up in the first lunar interlude, it was like, oh my God, it's Garfield, the deals warlock. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, I lo- I like those little crossovers, like how they celebrate candle nights, because that's um, um, the McElroy's sort of non-denominational oh, winter holiday yeah. that they celebrate, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. <laughs> so for that's a that's a that's a fun sort of community callback too. My goal for the uh, the forthcoming experiments that they're going to be doing is to. Uh, Somehow, either via Twitter or their donation thingy, um, to get my name in them. Get get a character I know. Oh my god, yeah, that'd be so cool. I am so envious. <laughs> I, you know, and yeah, like it's so cool to to think that. Well, the, and because they do it that way, they get such a diversity of names. Yeah, uh, it, and you know, just things they wouldn't have come up with otherwise. Like, and so yeah. many important mm-hmm. characters were were mm-hmm. named that way it's got to be such an honor you know to be like yeah i'm the original angus like i'm <laughs> you know i'm the, uh. well and we've seen what ha- what happens when they name things <laughs> oh and very blue like that, jeans that, 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 <laughs> very blue jeans and that 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 like celestial at the end oh yeah jeff andrew like mandarin jeff, jeff, andrew. jeff andrew yeah <laughs> Jeff Andrew, that's what they do when left to their devices. Oh boy. Uh. <laughs> oh, I, let's talk a little bit more about um, the the Bond stuff because I thought that was re- like I mean that was their own sort of amalgamation of gameplay, right? Like he had sort of sort come up with of. That. So actually, it's it's interesting because um, that that system that they played with um, for the stolen century was it was basically of Griffin's devising, but it was heavily based on the system um, Tales from the Apocalypse. I believe is what it's called. Yeah. When yeah. I'm actually I'm I'm playing Apocalypse World these days. Um, that's that Apocalypse game. So it's so I'm like getting more familiar. I was like, oh yeah, no, that's totally what Griffin did. Um, he he tailored it to what they were doing, but he ran yeah. it very much like that system. Um, and so mm-hmm. and that system does have like a relationship. They, um, in in Apocalypse World is called like History Plus or something. I can't remember, mm-hmm. but it does like affect. Um, like day to day like the people with the most like history together like make choices Mm -hmm. for each other it's very interesting um so he used it more as like a thing to store up for later as like a currency well yeah and it and it was so interesting because he's like i'm gonna tell you later what the bond and it was something else um, are gonna be used for but right now you're using your your um items yeah and i was like okay and i thought he was gonna tell us like right after that but then it waited till the final battle yeah i was like what what is this like where is this gonna go and yeah that was really great I... the the one thing i will say is that the final battle was a little anticlimactic um but that's only because they kept getting such great roles <laughs> but it was it was almost sort of like exciting just to see them like just win yeah. and it, and everything pay because it really felt like a payoff it was like all of this that they did and everyone that they met and everything that they accomplished was adding up into this triumph you know they earned it well yeah and even though they had a ton of great roles in that final battle they only won because of the bond yes so that was like and that was a little a lot less mathematical i'm assuming on griffin's part he was just like okay i'm going to make this really cool yeah i mean and and i think he probably had some idea of like and on this next one they're going to deal you know i'm going to roll this to to determine how much yeah. they mm-hmm. hurt 
but I'm yeah, going to invent what's going to happen. And he probably sort of thought about, like, if they pick this person, maybe I'll do this kind of thing. But, you know, he couldn't have known. Because yeah. in um, the, the Adventure Zone Zone, uh, <laughs> their <laughs> podcast episode they recorded after finishing the series, uh, Griffin was talking about how he was, like, unsure if Travis was going to summon um, Magnus's wife, Julia, um, and I, I'm glad mm-hmm. that they didn't. And they talk about how that was the right choice to make to not summon her because it would have sort of lessened the impact of their reunion later. Like, it wasn't the right mm-hmm. moment for them to see each other again. Yeah. But he had considered what he would do if they did <laughs> make that choice. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's, that's where the collaboration comes in. Is like, he had an idea for, like, okay, they're going to be co- bringing characters they love back. And they're going to do really cool stuff. But I'm not going to... I don't know who the heck they're going to pick. Like, I have a list, basically. Yeah, like, but... plausible choices. And then Clint throws that curveball of friggin' Garfield the Deals Warlock. Like, you know Griffin <laughs> never considered that anyone would summon him. Like, that was yeah. completely a bolt out of the blue. And it was so funny. And he that was, like, one of the best lines of the whole friggin' episode was when he's like, The best thing about Fantasy Costco, free samples! <laughs> <laughs> I loved that. Like Griffin's a genius. He's so funny. The, as as a family, they are like um, superheroes. Just so good. At, <laughs> well, <laughs> they're just really good at coming up with catchphrases. They're so funny. They're just the funniest boys. Ugh. Like like some of the the things. Oh, I don't remember who they who he brought back, but he it was like um, oh he said the sassiest thing ever. <sighs> oh my goodness. I'm blanking. I should have re-listened to it. Yeah, I um, should do that too. Now, it was something... I don't remember. I need like a list of everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, let me think. Okay, they summoned the Power Bear. Uh, they summoned... Yeah, and, and that one I was a little disappointed with because he had just fought the Power Bear. Yeah. And, like, the... but, and so I was like... Uh, but it was a smart and I didn't choice. And the relationship was... It was. No, it worked. <laughs> I mean, it's like if I was going to summon <laughs> but... somebody to fight, the Power Bear would be high on my list. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But let's see, there was Garfield, there was Joaquin, there was... It might have been Joaquin. I don't remember what he said, though. It was like an, some sort of spinoff of what they usually say with like... I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're sort of... Yeah, I'm blanking. Man, but speaking of Joaquin, um, oh, I think my maybe my favorite thing ever that happened in the entire show was when Joaquin was like, everything's going to be okay. I have magic powers. <laughs> like, yeah, calling yeah. back to Taco mm-hmm. saying that was like, ah, mm-hmm. Griffin's just too good. Like, he's such a good writer. It's crazy to think that this is the first thing he ever wrote. I mean, and he's been writing well, it for I mean, three he years. Obviously writes... He writes for Polygon too, but and not like, he doesn't that's write. That's probably a prose. lot less like writing. Writing. He's a journalist, yeah, not a an more, author. <laughs> yeah, that's very different. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah, like the, the Adventure Zone was the first creative writing he ever did in any kind of like meaningful, intentional way, um, and it's astounding. Mm-hmm. I mean, and when you're just working on a thing and writing it constantly, you know, for three years, like. You're gonna make something probably of some quality, but it's it's remarkable what he did. And actually, he um One, he wrote a story for a Star Wars anthology that's being published uh, a while back. Oh, awesome! Yeah, I really want to read it. That's cool. Uh, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff with like the Star Wars comics. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing that's really it's funny about the the show, but also I think. Um, really literary is their them not adhering to like all the traditional like fantasy stuff. Oh yeah, like, they're rejecting it pretty much outright. Like if they do, it's always yeah. very like tongue in cheek. Yeah, like the name Taco, <laughs> like that's <laughs> the starting point, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, I told my dad about that. I'm from TV. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, I when I when I I. I got my my dad interested in the show when i told him that one of the characters was t-a-a-k-o the wizard he was like yeah. okay <laughs> that's really good like that's really really good i think i have to check this out <laughs> well it makes me think of of 
poetry, which uh, there's not, I don't know, it's not not poetic, but like uh, in, in poetry, they say, or some people say that you shouldn't like put markers of the, the time period that you're writing in. You want something to be timeless, mm. quote unquote. Um, but honestly, it's way more authentic if you like date it and and use po- like references to, to what's happening in the world and like having fantasy Costco there is like hilarious and and like everybody knows what a fucking Costco yeah, is and it's... if you don't you have the other thing the the Sam's Club yeah you know? yeah everyone knows Costco <laughs> yeah and whenever they have anything that's like this isn't something that exists in a fantasy world they just call it fantasy that <laughs> just yeah. cracks me up every time fasten your fantasy seat belts you know <laughs> well it's like if you think about it why wouldn't there be funny people in this sort of in like a fantasy even if it was realistic you know mm-hmm. like there's, there's funny people with like weird senses of humor that have giant poisonous flaming swords of doom or whatever yeah do you i mean I can, oh, man that's like not even a good question i was gonna ask you if you had a favorite villain but you don't even know because you haven't listened to most of it <laughs> um i oh i don't know yeah i didn't really have any villains um, oh, man i think sorry. you're gonna <laughs> wait so d- did did you listen to the suffering game or did you start like right after the suffering game Probably right after, I think. Oh, that hurts. Because I think that the Lich Twins in The Suffering Game would be your favorite. Yeah. I fully anticipate that. They are amazing. (laughs) They're just, like, these amazing, voguing, like, high fashion elf, like, liches. They're just, like, on the catwalk, just posing, and they're just so cool. (laughs) Okay, yeah, that would be my favorite. I need to go back. <laughs> you wow, need to listen to that one so much. <laughs> oh, that's right up my. That's that's basically reminding me a lot of my second book of poetry. So yeah, I need to go back and listen. To that. Yeah, no, you're gonna love Lydia and Edward a lot. They're great. <laughs> They're and I just like the way they they handled liches in this universe. I think that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a lot more. I mean, because it's just their own take on it. Because that's not really what liches are like in. Dungeons yeah. and Dragons, like they're a lot more sort of inherently malicious. They're just monsters. So for to take them, them and humanize them was really cool. Well, it was it was humanizing them, and then in the Stolen Century, it's like we are going to become liches, so we're more powerful. And it in in a way that dehumanized those characters a little bit, just because like they don't have the same stake that everybody else has like they're all they're all being resurrected but like they have like a second resurrection they basically have Mm -hmm. um so that was really interesting to see how that sort of impacted the decisions they made yeah it really had a especially on loop i would say like barry i think was always sort of the cautious type but loop Mm -hmm. really let herself become more I don't know what the word is uh, but yeah she she had more of sort of a devil may care attitude and felt a little less restrained which is interesting because she was initially very much a voice of reason mm-hmm. you know she was the one who was like hey maybe n- not destroying a civilization I don't think that's a thing we should do uh, yeah it's so fascinating to me that they had to re-record that bit mm-hmm. with the with the robot world. Like they like the first time they did it, they just destroyed it, and then they immediately were like, "That was the wrong decision, and we shouldn't have made that choice, and these characters wouldn't have done that, and we screwed it up. We need to fix it." Well, and and that makes me think of like um, this is a really out there reference, but uh, the game Fable. <laughs> like you have the option of being to completely evil and murdering everybody but like often that's really unsatisfying and i think they probably had the the the, the because they had so many chances at this sort of like oh you're going to be they didn't actually visit 100 different worlds but like they basically had to sort of fill in the gap for a lot of them yeah like at some point you're gonna be like okay what if this works we'll just kill everybody you know yeah and they it probably just left them so unsatisfied they were like yeah that was really weird we were just kind of 
Um, well, yeah, and, and I trying playing God a little bit. And I and I think that you know maybe you know they were trying to be like logical about it, but then when they thought like no, like Magnus would not have made that choice. You know, these characters yeah. Merle would never think that was an okay thing to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe Taco would do it, but <laughs> <laughs> Lulu, I really want to blow it up. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting for them to have to take that moment and be like, no, we got to go back and redo this. Like, that wasn't the right thing for the story. That was the wrong choice. Not just, like, morally, but, like, narratively wrong. It would have really, uh, I think, soured the rest of the show. Yeah. that w- I mean, especially, like, what that would do to Loop's relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Like, that would have been a oh, huge yeah. thing. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> like I feel like 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 the the sibling relationship between Loop and Taka would have gone a weird place if that had happened because she'd be like, "You are not the brother I thought I had." Mhm. And that's a huge thing, you know, <laughs> at that point in their lives. Yeah, that was really fascinating to to hear that that had happened. Yeah, and and I I want to just say to people that are still listening and <laughs> who even uh, don't know what we're talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, so in we already talked about the Adventure Zone Zone or the 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 the, the Adventure Zone Zone. Yes. Um, uh, after the finale, they discussed sort of themes they were drawing upon, and um, I mean, obviously, they're family members that are you know doing a a show together, but the characters aren't. Not all the characters are family, and initially they weren't at all. Um, yeah. And it's just really interesting how big of a role family played into the whole series. Well, and especially found family. That's something they brought Yeah, up. and they, they mentioned that specifically. Yeah, they were like, you know, even though there are family members, it's all about, like, these are the people we're living with, and we choose to live with them and to, and to, to you know, have relationships with them. Yeah, like uh, it just reminded me of um, ah, there's this great bit in um, in one of the live episodes. <laughs> it's really mm-hmm. funny. Um, at, at a certain point, they they all think they're gonna die, <laughs> and <laughs> someone's like, "Do you have any last words?" And Magnus is like, "I just want to say that I lost my family, but I was really happy that I found a new family with you guys." And I just love you so much. <laughs> it was the it was the sweetest thing. I love Magnus. Oh man, Aww. when he got reunited with Julia, I was just sobbing, like I, <laughs> weeping, weeping. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was listening to this with Will. Um, we listened to the last episode yeah. together, and I was just sitting there, like with my hands on my face, just like trying not to make any noise as I'm just like. Ah! <laughs> just dying oh it was that was that was a heavy moment for me god travis is the one who always mm-hmm. does it to me man his friggin there's a bit nah you haven't listened to it oh my god yeah during um <laughs> uh the 11th hour he has some stuff that that mm-hmm. really really made me cry <laughs> too <laughs> like he, it's a, it's it's that sort of sweet earnestness like taco's fascinating and merle's really really wonderful but they don't get a lot of those super truthful moments the way that Magnus does. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and just like, I don't know a ton about them as people, but Travis is sort of like the the thinker of them. He's the lover of them. He's the boy with the yeah. big, big heart. I love him so much. I was I was watching uh, the TV show they did for my big bam. Oh God, it's so um, funny. My brother, my brother, and me for those uh, uninitiated. Yeah, that show is um, hilarious. I I watched through the entire was, series was, in one day. Yeah, I had to also because it went free on like some. Yeah, it's on Verve now. It got moved to. Everybody, yeah. check it out. Yeah. My bim bam, free um, on Verve. <laughs> And I was just watching the the one where they go to like the teenagers and they like try to teach them stuff. And he's just like they're, he's just like with those two kids and they're like painting nails. Positive and, like, doing yelling. Art. <laughs> <laughs> that 
that's 100 percent travis as a human being like that he's just the personification of the phrase positive yelling <laughs> yes yes for sure <laughs> he's just a big loud boy who loves you he's so good he's, no that episode was so funny. i thought it was a really f- the thing that surprised me about that episode is that only one person chose griffin and it was a boy named griffin <laughs> Right, which is which is like amazing, but like, like knowing them, I feel like if if people were familiar with them, most people would pick Griffin. Yeah. So that was a little interesting. Yeah. I know. Like, I, yeah, it's funny. Also, I wonder how much of it was staged. True, but like, and and that's where you start to see his his very odd creativity. The clown sort of box. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, did that... you know what's funny though is I totally know where that idea came from. Strangely enough, um, let me guess, another episode. Well, sort of. <laughs> so it, the clown box is a whole brand new thing birthed from Griffin's mind for the show. Okay, but they mm-hmm. talk a few times on my on the podcast about this place they used to get their hair cut as children. Um, uh-huh. and it was like this little local place, I think, but they had this weird sort of like a, a hole in the wall where you would, oh, no. t- uh, ch- children would take their cut hair, like the hair from the ground. Oh, and, that is horrible. And they put it in this hole and then a toy comes out. <laughs> it's really weird. They talk about That's that. That's very weird. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing. They're like, yeah, I don't think other people had that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just that place. But yeah, so so that's what it immediately reminded me of was that yeah, weird okay. haircutting place when they were kids. <laughs> oh, of course he had goodness. to put his own Griffin McElroy spin on it and make it this horrifying clown box, but Right. <laughs> I've abandoned my boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh so I know that um, you know, you obviously haven't got you know you haven't listened to the entire series but do you think you, at this point you have a favorite character oh um i don't know how, it, to the degree of favorites but i i think lucretia is really interesting oh, she is um, she is griffin talks about her being his favorite yeah i think just i i, I love i'm a sucker for interesting characters or even like Characters that are so one-dimensional that it's become interesting. Um, and we'll have to talk a little bit about that uh, once we're done talking about the Venture Zone because I have a, a whole other topic that I just realized that we need to talk about. Good. Um, Great. <laughs> but uh, I don't know who else. I I mean, you got to love Taco, like, in every yeah, way. Yeah, he's... Um, especially the fact that, like... Um, He's gay. Yeah. Like, obviously, I immediately immediately connect on that level. Um, and that's such a su- surprising thing that, that, that I was, like... Well, yeah, and uh, just good on Justin for, good way for taking that chance and saying, like, this is not an experience that I know, but I want to learn about it and try to portray it. And they didn't make it a joke. Of course not. They're good boys. Like, I'm so proud of them for being so good. And, like, yeah. The were... joke is that he's, 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 his boyfriend is the Grim Reaper. Yeah. That's the, the, joke. the joke is that he's just, like, a total terrible person and he's really, really funny. The joke is never that he's gay. And, like, yeah, there's this bit um, where they need to get, they decide they need to get some summer clothes. <laughs> <laughs> they have to get. They're going to a hot place, and they have to get some summer clothes. And Lucretia's like, "Are uh, you serious? Are we really doing this right now?" Uh, and so they have to decide what summer clothes they're picking out. They go shopping, and uh-huh. Taco decides he wants a skirt. And they're just like, "Okay, yeah, a skirt. What does it look like? Is it long? Is it short? What color is it?" And like, they just, "Okay, you're wearing a skirt. Sounds good." And it's you know mm-hmm. that's just how it how it happens. And so that's why Taco's like always drawn in a skirt now. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they 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 go with their instincts, and then they think about what that actually means. You know, like they go with they see it through. Like, yeah, they don't they don't just make it a joke. And if even if it starts as a joke, like a skirt is funny be, because it's 
not what you immediately would yeah. think of, you know. But the thing is, he um, doesn't even approach it as being like, "Oh, I know." He'll, he's just like, "Oh, yeah. he's wearing a skirt, obviously. Like, <laughs> obviously, yeah. I'm wearing a skirt." Well, yeah. <laughs> it fits the character. Uh-huh. It fits the character. It does. But but that's why it's funny. I don't know. It, it's, 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 it's there's a level of humor there. Yeah. It's sophisticated. I think. I, I think it's so very too. Sophisticated. Because yeah, the the femininity is not the butt of the joke. In it, in fact, it might be like sort of ironically funny because like other people would joke about that but they're not like it's not funny Mm -hmm. and that's why it's funny (laughs) they're taking it seriously yeah Mm -hmm. yeah they're they're subverting something there yes yeah for sure i love it i love it yeah and like loop (laughs) is just a trans girl and she just is that's just yep that's just the way it is and they also talk about that a lot in the the after show they you know they talk about like we don't want to mess it up but, like, keep us accountable, which is really important. Yeah, and they, you know, like, just, or Griffin was sort of disheartened to find out that he had played into the barrier gaze trope at a certain point, and he was like, ah, dang yeah. it, I didn't even know that was a thing, that I screwed up. And then he found a way to fix it, and I love it. I love him for it. <laughs> well, and, like... Having the Grim Reaper be gay, like, everybody, all the gays would want to die. You know, they'd want to go hang out. Uh, Kravitz, I love Kravitz. I really... That's really, that's really dark, but, like... <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, he's... Uh, well, and that's the great thing. You know, I often see in, like, fan portrayals of him, like, you know, fan art or, or fan fiction or whatever, uh, Kravitz is, mm-hmm. is portrayed as being very sort of sophisticated and serious, um... But the thing is, he's super not, like, people yeah. think that he is because he's this, like, <laughs> fancy Grim Reaper boy. But if you go back, like, pay attention. When you get to Crystal Kingdom, which is where Kravitz is introduced, he is the most goofball character ever. Like, it's so, f- he's using this dumb <laughs> accent and he's saying really goofy shit. And he's like, wow, you guys aren't intimidated by me at all all and they're like nope and like, <laughs> he has a really good uh griffin's voice for him is really good too the, well <laughs> yeah i don't know if you've heard the original kravitz voice oh i'm sure it's very different it's very very <laughs> different <laughs> yeah he's he he tried to do him with a with a british accent and it didn't work oh, out no. very well and so at a certain point he turns it into a joke where he's like yeah. he's like try, talking in his british accent and then he's like do you mind if i switch to my normal voice it's i i use that accent for work <laughs> and it's like <laughs> i know it's so funny he's so funny like kravitz is not serious he's a totally goofy character i love it <laughs> Which is perfect for a Grim Reaper, because, like, the only other depiction of a Grim Reaper that is not serious 100% of the time, I'm thinking of, like, the Discworld. Yeah. I didn't oh, read those man. books. Oh, man. Terry Pratchett's but, Death is so but good. But I watched a couple... I, I watched a couple of the couple of the movies mm-hmm. and Death is hilarious. Yeah, I'm getting really stoked. Uh, sidebar for the Good Omens TV show that's in the works because Death is in that too, and I can't wait to see how oh, they nice. do him. I mean, I'm stoked for Good Omens because it's a Good Omens, but that part's especially intriguing. Hmm, cool. Yeah. But, no, like, Kravitz is so, so funny. And, like, people just forget it. Because they're, like, goofing around. And, like, Kravitz is just also doing that. Like, you know, they're just being yeah. themselves. And, and Kravitz is like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? <laughs> like, he's just utterly appalled <laughs> by them. And it's it's very funny. <laughs> it's, ah. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll definitely have to. Because I want to, like, learn more about all the people. Yeah. All the different characters. People, uh, people love to, because you know, like they're the they're those sort of silly, not to disparage, but those those silly concepts that float around places like Tumblr of like um, soulmate AU. Like in this world, uh, your eyes change color the day you meet your soulmate. You know, whatever kinds of yeah, silly things. Yeah, like that. Yeah. There's a popular one that's the first words that your soulmate will speak to you are tattooed on your body from birth. And people people joke because the first thing that Taco says to Kravitz is, Yo, thug, what's your name? I'm about to tentacle your dick. (laughs) 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 There's so much fun in this podcast. I just got... And yet, and yet, other times it just makes me weep. Like, how do they do that? 
How do they just make me laugh my ass off and then cry my eyes out? Well, and that's, like, I think another sign that it's really sophisticated is, you know, like, being able to do both. Yeah, because it never... Like, I would say that's... They earn it. They always earn it. Yeah. Well, there's other examples of that, like Buffy. People laugh out loud and it's it's really emotional. Um, Buffy never hit me like this. Off the top of my head. (laughs) Well, that's true. But, like... No, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's, you know, what's a great example is like um, James Gunn's movies. Uh, yes, because mm-hmm. he's very, very, very good at those tonal shifts. In fact, he's, I think, sort of a master of, you know, finding the right moment to cut the comedy and you know hit you with something emotional, and then oh, it's getting too emotional. We got to throw in a joke. Like he's he's just very good at that balance. It's it's pretty remarkable. See, um, I just bought Guardians 2 and I rewatched it. And the first time I watched it, I thought there were some missteps in terms of that tone. It didn't um, work quite as well as the first it, one. It, it didn't, but I think just, just because it was a sequel, it was really hard to like take what worked and also make them grow as characters. Yeah. And and having so many char- so many different characters all have to sort of grow was, I think, really a tough challenge. But watching it a second time really sort of... I started to see the little things because Drax was a sore thumb in the second movie the first time I watched it. I was mm. like, why is he just like cracking jokes 100% of the time and there's nothing emotional going on here? But then as I rewatched it, I was like, oh, he's sort of like hiding something and he eventually starts to share that with Mantis. Yeah. Um, his like his like heartbreak and his his loss that he's gone through yeah now yeah because in the first movie it was just he was in this mode of like i have to get revenge i have this mission and now that his mission is accomplished he just has to live with his grief well yeah well he has to live with his grief and he also has the chance to like have a little fun yeah and live his life again because he might enjoy himself more when he's being funny yeah yeah, and no, I, I did enjoy Which, I mean, Guardians. I, I know certainly I do. I, I I would definitely recommend if people didn't love it. I mean, most people probably did, but like give it another if, watch if they didn't to see it a second time. Yeah, because I really I really enjoyed it a lot more. Mm-hmm. Have you seen Gunn's um, earlier movie uh, Super? I didn't finish it. I wa- I think I wanted to start it, but I just I you know we can't get every movie every time. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that one. I mean, it's definitely it. It can be uh, tough at times to watch. Like it, yeah. it's it's a really um, it, it can be upsetting. But I think that one is a is yeah. a prime example of his ability to be really really funny and then just like hit you in the gut. I I, I just thought of the perfect um of, of another example. So I was recommending to my my best friend before she leaves for Chile because they have different Netflix uh, availability there. Um, oh yeah, I, I haven't thought that of that. Watch, yeah, <laughs> uh, I recommend that she watch uh, a movie called Other People, and oh. it stars Molly Shannon and and this uh, this young comedian guy. Uh, and in the movie, he's gay. I'm pretty sure he's in life, real life too, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but it's like so hysterical and relatable, and just utterly heartbreaking. And it's. Like, Molly Shannon has always been one of my favorites because she's just so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, she is like, she will make you ball. Yeah, she is a a surprisingly talented dramatic actor. She, and and she is, and she, I think there were talk, there was talk that she was going to be nominated for this role, for the Oscar, but she, she wasn't, and I think she, she probably could have won. I, I, she should have won. She should have been nominated and she should have won. <laughs> I w- and I would recommend this movie because it's so good. It's so good. Well, good. Yeah, I, I, I'd been curious about it, but it was just sort of like on my periphery. So the, the little um, thumbnail on Netflix before you click on it is a, a, probably the most funny scene in, in the movie where the this um, uh, little gay kid is doing like basically a drag performance and it's just like so amazingly sincere and hilarious no oh, that sounds sweet it's so sweet and it's so funny <laughs> <laughs> 
That does it for today's episode. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to us on YouTube if you absolutely love us and like us if you just kind of like us. Also follow us on Twitter at LitMeritPod. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song, Fraud, from his album Artificial Heart. Until next time, remember, no No guilty guilty pleasures. pleasures.